Good afternoon and welcome everybody. Thank you for coming out on a snowy afternoon. Welcome to the Leo Beck Institute and the Center for Jewish History. My name is William Weitzer. I'm the executive director of the Leo Beck Institute. There are so many familiar faces here that I hardly need to introduce the Leo Beck Institute. Founded in 1955, we are celebrating our 60th birthday this year. And throughout that time, our mission has remained constant to preserve and promote the history and culture of German-speaking Jewry. And without a doubt, today's symposium supports that mission. Wissenschaft's Judentum was central to the Enlightenment and subsequently the emancipation of Jews in Germany. Today, we will discuss the history of Wissenschaft and the, le and the legacy that is still felt today, felt today. We have also opened an exhibition that I hope you'll see today or come back and visit, Wissenschaft's Judentum, Jewish Studies and the Shaping of Jewish Identity in the Catherine and Clifford Goldsmith Gallery here at the center. There are many people to acknowledge and I just want to quickly name as many as possible. We are co-presenting this program with the Herbert D. Katz Center for Advanced Judaic Studies, where a year-long academic seminar has taken place on this topic. I welcome many of the participants who have come from Philadelphia, and especially Steve Weitzman and Ann Albert, who worked with us on this program. I'd also like to thank the LBI staff who are here, Carol Kahn Strauss, our international director, Frank Mecklenburg, our research director, David Brown, our director of communications and programming, also, Renata Stein and Renata Evers are here who were primarily responsible for that beautiful exhibition upstairs. We have board members here, Joan Lessing, David Sorkin, Michael Meyer, and Henry Feingold. And also, Ismar Shores, the president emeritus of LBI, who has been a wonderful advisor to me during the first two years and was, of course, of invaluable help to the Leo Beck Institute for many, many years. Um, many of you were here to help us honor Ismar, and I also thank you for your contributions in support of this event. To um, fully hand out the honor, I would like to call upon two more of our board members, Robert S. Rifkin and Ronald B. Sobel, LBI's president. Thank you, Dr. Weitzer. <laughs> okay. It's both an honor and a great pleasure for me to participate in these proceedings. It's an honor to be able to speak on behalf of the Leo Beck Institute, and it's a pleasure to speak of my old counselor, guide, and friend, Ismar Shorsh. I first met Dr. Schorsch some 40 years ago at a dinner at the JTS uh, Jewish Theological Seminary Sukkah. We were introduced by Dr. Gerson Cohen. I am forever indebted to Dr. Cohen for many things, but this is among the foremost of them. I may be the only person to have noticed, but I doubt it, that the, of all the fruits of the Jewish calendar, of all the fruits of Jewish civilization, I should say, the Jewish calendar travels less well through the varied climates of the diaspora. Sukkah in New York can be a very chilly dinner. <laughs> this dinner was not chilly, and it was warmed by a lively conversation with then Dean Schorsch. And from that came an enduring relationship Few days later, I received from Dr. Schorsch a copy of his then recently published translation and introduction to Gretz's Structure of Jewish History and Other Essays. I pulled that volume from the shelf the other day as I was thinking of this event. I thumbed through it and found one passage marked with a bold stroke in the margin. I frankly don't remember whether I put it there or Dr. Schorsch put it there as a gentle nudge to his new admirer. But it reads relevantly to today. For Judaism, Gretz said in his essay on the status of Judaism, for Judaism, which does not rest upon the broad basis of state institutions, 
indifference is far more deadly than apostasy. If this indifference is to be shaken into life, Judaism must more lavishly display and make use of its civilizing riches. So let me say at the very start, Ismar Shors certainly shook me into liveliness. And I have not met anyone in the last half century who has more lavishly displayed or made better use of Judaism's civilizing riches. Now you find me in an awkward position. I am a little bit like the legendary Shlemiel who is going to give to a heavenly audience a lecture on the Johnstown flood, only to be told that Noah was in the audience. It would take a lot of chutzpah on my part to offer uh, a, a critical assessment of the merits of Dr. Schorch's contributions to the study of German Jewry and Wissenschaft. But it would be utter madness to try to do so before an audience of scholars. Chutzpah I'm capable of. Madness I'm still working on. <laughs> now, on the other hand, it really won't do to leave you with the impression that the trustees of the Leo Beck Institute didn't know what they were doing when they give out their most cherished award. And your, test, uh, your presence here testifies to the proposition that you concur in their judgment in this case. So what am I to do in this position? I think the best thing I can do is to testify to nothing but the bare facts. They are objective facts. I offer them without filigree or adulteration. So what one may, what one may say of Dr. Schorsch? Born in Hanover, raised in Potsdam town, PhD in Jewish history under Sala Baron from Columbia, ordained at the Jewish Theological Seminary, where in due course he became the Rabbi Herman Abramowitz Professor of Jewish History, Dean of the Graduate School, Provost, and in 1986, Chancellor. During the 20 years he served as Chancellor, the seminary blossomed, its endowment doubled, its faculty grew, its student body enlarged, the William Davidson Graduate School of Jewish Education was established, Project Judaica, a joint venture of JTS and the Moscow State University was launched to bring Jewish studies to Russia. The Seminario Rabinico in Buenos Aires was nourished. The, uh, the Schechter Institute for Jewish Studies in Jerusalem was quickened into life as a full-fledged Israeli institution of higher education. And for 18 years, not the least, Ismar served as president of the Leo Beck Institute and brought it and its great archives and library from its humble dwelling on 73rd Street into the partnership that created the Center for Jewish History in whose hall we gathered this afternoon. All of those things have more than the fingerprints of Dr. Schorsch on them. They happened because Ismar saw to it that they happened. So you might say now, Dianu. But it wasn't Dianu for Ismar. When carrying out all those executive burdens, Ismar produced a stream of scholarly writing. I'm sure you're familiar with them. In 1972, he published Jewish Reactions to German Anti-Semitism, 1870 to 1914. In 1975, he published the aforementioned edition of Gretz's Historical Essays. Through the years, he published a growing body of learned papers and lectures on Wissenschaft, on Frankel, on Sunz, and on many other themes many collected in From Text to Context, the turn to history in modern Judaism, and still others found in the volumes of the Leo Beck yearbook. And then there were the talks on other themes, Israel, Jewish education, the religious life, war, peace, health, the environment, all reflecting keen insight and many requiring very considerable courage. And far from least, there is Ismar's commentary on the weekly Torah portion, 
gathered now in the volume Canon Without Closure, which has inspired a worldwide congregation of tens of thousands. You might say that was enough too, but I must say I found uh, Ismar in the reading room of the Leo Beck Institute some months ago. He looked younger, fresher, more energetic, and happier than I'd ever seen him in many years. And I thought to myself, the Greeks had a giant named Antaeus who gained strength by touching the earth. We have a giant who gained strength by touching our archives. There is one more thing I can personally testify to. I had been watching Ismar from the back benches in the boardrooms of the seminary, the Schechter Institute in Jerusalem, and the Leo Beck Institute. In each of those settings, he expanded our horizons beyond the humdrum business of board activities. He sensitized us to our roots, our connections, our possibilities. He made us feel engaged as links in the vast chain of Jewish history and that we should feel with both pride and responsibility for that linkage. He did that with modesty, with gentleness, and with bright clarity that only real mastery of a subject permits. He not only taught us much, but he seemed to us to exemplify the attributes of his heroes. In 1975, Ismar delivered the Leo Beck Memorial Lecture. He concluded that lecture with these words. The objective study of Jewish political history is no longer just an end in itself. Its results must also serve as a source of instruction and stimulation for Jewish civil servants, communal leaders, politicians, and statesmen in the diaspora and in Israel whose awesome responsibility it is to secure the Jewish future. In Ismar Shorsh's hands, the study of history has done just that. And it's now my pleasure to turn the proceedings over to the master of the house, Rabbi Sobel. Robert, it's particularly a joy and an honor to share this moment with you as you so lovingly expressed your admiration, indeed the admiration of all of us, for Ismar Shorsh. Learned scholars, precious colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, as you know, even better than I, during that long era known as the biblical period, neither early tribal nor later Israel, Israelite identity was shaped by scholarship. Indeed, on the contrary, among the ancient Hebrews, identity was defined as a shared understanding of belonging to a collective covenant as well as by the names that people were given. In that biblical period, it was commonly thought that the name that was given to a man or to a woman somehow was a reflection of their inner essence. Ismar. The name Ismar is a variant of Itamar, referring to a palm tree, and the more commonly used feminine equivalent, Tamar, has the connotations of upright, suggesting qualities of righteousness, gracefulness, integrity. And that Ismar Shorsh is precisely what you are. Upright, thorough, 
standing tall with your scholarship, standing tall among your scholarly peers, respected, and at the very base of that tree, your students and disciples thirsting and drinking of your scholarly endeavors. And righteous and graceful you are in your dealings with your family, your colleagues, and your friends. And so is Mar Schorsch, as one of your successors in the presidency of the Leo Beck Institute, it is truly my honor on behalf of the Leo Beck Institute to present to you now our highest award, the Leo Beck Medal. Ismar, please come forth. <clears throat> Bob, <clears throat> I thank you for that heartfelt and uh, well-researched uh, tribute. It got you pretty close to the archives. <clears throat> and Ron, I thank you for the honor of uh, this Leo Beck Memorial Lecture. <clears throat> Bob was on my search committee when uh, the trustees invited me to become the Chancellor of the Seminary, and Bob was at my side through those 20 years of uh, uh, excitement. And Bob has been by my side here at the Leo Beck Institute, as well as in Jerusalem at the Jerusalem, uh, at the Schechter Institute. So it has been a wonderful, gratifying partnership, Bob, uh, which I continue to treasure. I wish to recall the memory of Leo Beck with a comment that he made in 1945 after he had uh, survived Theresienstadt. And this is what he said here in New York. For us Jews from Germany, a historical era has come to an end. Such an era ends whenever a hope, a belief, a trust has finally to be buried. Our belief was that the German and the Jewish spirit could meet on German soil and through their marriage become a blessing. This was an illusion. The Jewish era in Germany is over once and for all. Ten years later, Leo Beck allowed the founders of the Leo Beck Institute to use his name. These founders bore the burden of the past. They anticipated no future. They were embers rescued from the conflagration, ud mutsal misrefa, in the words of uh, the prophet Amos. And those embers would eventually die out. But they were determined to collect the remnants of German Jewry. Leo Beck was not entirely correct. There was a glorious marriage that took place on German soil, and the founders of the Leo Beck Institute wanted to preserve echoes and remnants of that 
marriage. I came to the Leo Beck Institute in 1966, some 11 years after it had been founded. And it was still preoccupied with the past, uh, oblivious as to what the future held. I had uh, the deep experience of spending time with Max Kreuzberger, with Fred Lessing, with Fred Grubel, with Max Grunewald, and the extraordinary cluster of devoted intellectuals that created the Institute. The Institute and I grew together. A doctoral student, his education is not finished with the achievement of the doctorate. In my case, my education flourished thereafter. And it flourished here in the soil of the Leo Beck Institute. And the Leo Beck Institute, I think, to the surprise of its founders, flourished. And if I were to uh, identify a turning point, it was the beginning of the three-volume series by Professor Monika Richards called Jüdisches Leben in Deutschland, Jewish Life in Germany. Three volumes which chronologically arranged and published excerpts from the growing collection of memoirs by German Jews here in the Leo Beck Institute. Those three volumes were published from 76 to 82 in German. They were widely distributed in Germany and then edited down to a single volume that was distributed to high schools across the country. And in 1992, an English equivalent was translated and published by Indiana University Press. Those three volumes translated the six million of the Holocaust into individual lives. The tragedy of genocide is that we can't relate to it because of its astronomical number. But Judisches Leben in Deutschland presented the lives of Jews who had lived and suffered and flourished in Germany. With those volumes, the Leo Beck Institute began to penetrate deeply into Germany. This uh, symposium this afternoon brings together German scholars and American scholars on the influence of scholarship on the formation of Jewish identity. Today, Jewish studies flourishes in uh, Germany. Renata Evers tells me that the Leo Beck Institute receives some 1,000 books in German every year devoted to Jews and Judaism. At the Katz uh, Center, we have uh, a concrete demonstration of the extent of Jewish studies in Germany. It is not an exaggeration to say that there are three major centers for Jewish studies today. Israel, the United States, and Germany. The founders of the Leo Beck Institute would never have dreamed of such a resurrection. Their future, it was opaque to them, but I am convinced that the growth and flourishing of Jewish studies in Germany owes a deep debt of gratitude 
to the courage and persistence of the founders of the Leo Beck Institute. So this symposium, which brings together two panels, <clears throat> one of German scholars reflecting on the European responses to Jewish scholarship and American scholars <clears throat> reflecting on what Jewish scholarship has done to the formation of Jewish identity in this country. Scholarship is a very lonely exercise. <clears throat> it is done in archives and studies without much accompaniment. Uh, scholars often question, what will the result of my scholarship be? This is the question of the symposium. Can we identify consequences to the industry of Jewish scholarship? Has the identity of Jews in Europe, in Israel, in the United States been formed by the quiet uh, and lonely enterprise of Jewish scholarship? Uh, so I am pleased to uh, be able to bring together this afternoon the Katz Center with its substantial number of scholars from Germany engaged in Jewish studies and the Leo Beck Institute and its cadre of American Jewish scholars that are engaged in the entire spectrum of Jewish studies. So I thank you all for coming. Robert and Ronald, I thank you for the glorious honor of the Leo Beck Medal. Thank you. <laughs>
Uh, I hope that we will first hear all the three talks and then hopefully we will have time for uh, a, a brief discussion uh, before for the break. So I would just uh, like to uh, uh, say that Christian Wiese will be the first speaker um, during this panel and he will devote his presentation to the impact of the Wissenschaft on academic Jewish culture and identity among Jewish scholars. Please, Christian. Thank you very much. Dear Professor Schorsch, dear colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to start by expressing how honored and privileged I feel about the opportunity to participate in this symposium devoted to the Wissenschaft des Judentums, particularly given the wonderful occasion of the presentation of the Leo Beck Medal to Professor Ismar Schorsch. Ismar, please accept my warmest congratulations for this most deserved honor and for your work of a lifetime for your great achievements in so many fields of Jewish intellectual history, including the masterful interpretation of the turn to history in modern Judaism. And I cannot emphasize strongly enough to what extent my own work, and I dare to say the work of several generations now, scholars has been inspired and influenced by your book on Jewish reflections to German antisemitism, and especially by the rich insights assembled in From Text to Context. And thus, whatever I could say about the impact of Wissenschaft des Judentums on the Jewish academic culture in the past 200 years necessarily builds on what Ismar Schorz has so brilliantly described in his, in his essay, The Ethos of Modern Jewish Scholarship. The image of the culture shaped by that new ethos and created by the emergence of historical thinking within 19th century Judaism is complex and multifaceted. Firstly, as a product of the process of emancipation and integration into Western scholarly thinking, the new ethos included a revolutionary shift from traditional knowledge to historical critical thinking, quote, from the ready acceptance of a body of sacred text to the concern for, methodolog for methodological rigor, this is Ismar Shorsh, a transformation into an endogmatic, albeit not value-free scholarship on Judaism. Secondly, this new culture was characterized by the, by the determined will to break the predominance of Christian scholarship on Judaism and to make the Jewish voice heard in order to combat distorted, denigrating constructions of post-biblical Jewish history. A quote, again, is Shor's pervasive apologetic tone, according to him, which has to be understood as part of the imposed entanglement of Jewish scholarship into the predicament of German Jewry's fight for social in cultural acceptance. One only needs to read Franz Rosenzweig's essay on apologetics thinking in order to get a sense of both the dignity and the tragedy of an apologetic project that compelled Jewish scholars to constantly respond to the challenges of the non-Jewish scholarly world and the political implications involved. And thirdly, there is the existential dimension of Wissenschaft des Judentums, the awareness of the majority of her protagonists that the academic study of a vital tradition should not ignore the needs of a community that was for many reasons struggling for its identity. To varying degrees, these three elements, the historical and critical dialogue with Jewish tradition, an emancipatory impulse aimed at the external audience and the stabilization of internal identity precisely reflects the Wissenschaft's dominant self-conception in Germany before the Nazi period. In the following unsystematic remarks, I would like to focus on one specific aspect of the impact of Wissenschaft on Jewish scholars, namely on past and also present debates regarding the question of the Jewishness or the authenticity of scholarship devoted to Judaism. As a brief, very impressionistic look at controversies uh, on the integration of Wissenschaft des Judentums into the German university demonstrates, the Jewish responses to such questions before the Nazi period varied strongly. Fact is that the greatest disappointment that shaped the identity of Jewish scholars in the 19th and early 20th century was the marginalization they suffered on the part of non-Jewish cultural and academic politics. From Leopold Sunz through Abraham Geiger to Hermann Cohen, futile attempts were made to convince the authorities to establish a chair in Jewish studies at the philosophy department at a, uh, at a German university or a faculty of Jewish theology pursued in an effort to achieve the acknowledgement of Judaism 
as a legitimate tradition within modern society and culture to strengthen Jewish cultural self-awareness and to professionalize Jewish scholarship in dialogue with the canon of the humanities. The failure of this endeavor was quite rightly perceived as a symbolic expression of the reigning will to deny the Jewish minority full social and cultural participation. Particularly since the beginning of the 20th century, the protest against the deliberate discrimination of their scholarship became the central element of what I would consider a vigorous intellectual rebellion against the hegemonic role played by German Protestantism. Within this context, Neo-Kantian philosopher Hermann Cohen suggested in 1907 that Jewish donors should fund a chair for Jewish studies at a Prussian university with the assumption that only a Jewish scholar could occupy that position. And I quote Cohen, Judaism is our living religion. It is not merely a field of the study of antiquity nor of Christian theology nor simply of the history and philosophy of religion both of which even in gatherings of Orientalists and religious congresses regard Judaism as a preliminary stage of Christianity. A person of a different faith cannot lecture on the science of our, relig our living religion. A living religion can only be scientifically represented by someone who is part of it with his inner religiosity. This is distinguished from denominational bias by the scientific attitude and its public supervision. But a person with a different faith in his heart cannot scientifically represent the essence of a living religion. The response among Jewish colleagues was controversial. While many agreed, historian Ismail Bogen felt uneasy about Cohen's initiative and rejected the notion of a denominational chair in the philosophy department as extremely dangerous, as he says, because it could compromise the most important argument of the Jewish struggle for equality, namely that a university appointment should not depend on religious affiliation. Therefore, the only practically conceivable model was a department of Jewish theology, from his point of view, whose members would pursue Wissenschaft, as he wrote in later articles, in order to sustain living Judaism. And Sigmund Maybaum from the Lehranstalt in Berlin argued that Jewish studies was primarily not Jewish studies, but a discipline referring to objective, unbiased research which could, of course, could also be constructed and promoted by non-Jews. At the same time, for the sake of the independence of Jewish studies, Maibam demanded more support for the, existent, for the existing independent Jewish rabbinical seminaries. Non-Jewish scholars, such as the Berlin Egyptologist Adolf Ehrmann, for example, did not only reject denominational influence on university appointments, but went so far as to deny that Jewish scholars had the necessary distance from their subject, and he emphasized, quote, that to judge and evaluate the religious documents of a nation correctly, one may not belong to this religion himself. How does an Islamic colleague help us explain the Quran? In contrast to this, Hermann Cohen's liberal Protestant colleague Martin Rade suggested to establish an entire faculty of Jewish theology at the newly founded University of Frankfurt, only to be attacked by Old Testament scholar Hermann Gunkel, who emphasized the superiority of Protestant scholarship as the embodiment of objectivity, insinuating that, quote, much damage could emerge from a Jewish theology department in Frankfurt. Thus, the main experience was, therefore, one of exclusion that forced Jewish scholars to assert their right to define Jewish history and culture according to their own terms. Now, the contemporary situation of Jewish studies is, of course, very different than the one during the debates just described. However, some of the past discussions seem to resurface from time to time, albeit in completely different constellations. And I would just like to point to one example that has recently stirred some controversy. And some of you may have read the article Aaron Hughes, professor of Jewish studies uh, at the University of Rochester, published last spring in the Chronicle of Higher Education under the title, Jewish Studies is Too Jewish. This text, Hughes launched a provocative attack against what he considers, quote, as a marginalization of Jewish scholarship from within, in contrast to the marginalization exclusion of Wissenschaft des Judentums in Germany. Whilst the latter was engaged in an apologetic ideological project characterized by the will to justify the modernization of Jewish tradition and the need to defend Judaism against the prejudice of non-Jewish scholarship, contemporary Jewish studies, he claims, tends to be insular and ethnic dominated by religious or ethnic identity politics, 
with mainly Jewish students interested in the field, with Jewish scholars often being reluctant to connect their research to work in relevant, relevant cognate fields such as religious studies and history, with an exceeding role of Jewish funding bodies, and with a problematic attitude towards non-Jewish scholars in the field. Now this is admittedly a very generalizing and polemic article that sees Jewish studies at the crossroads and in serious need of reinventing itself as an academic discipline that ought to be devoted to the interdisciplinary study of Jewish tradition, history, and culture, that ought to be exposed to the full range of theoretical and methodological concerns of religious studies, and be as inclusive and diverse as possible when it comes to the participation of non-Jews. The academic culture he envisions is one of autonomy from political agendas and transgressing the boundaries imposed on it by the historical burden of its past exclusion of concepts of the authenticity of Jewish scholarship or of the distinction between insiders and outsiders in the research on Jewish texts and traditions. The debate about what contemporary academic culture among scholars of Judaism should be about the role of religious and ethnic identity in Jewish scholarship is complex and I anticipate that the complexities involved will come up during the roundtable discussion. Irrespective of whether or not the challenging views voiced within the context of these debates are doing justice to the current situation of Jewish studies, and personally I think they don't, they clearly seem to be revolving around questions rooted in what Michael Meyer in his brilliant essay uh, has characterized as the two persistent tensions of, uh, within Wissenschaft des Judentums. Tensions, he argues, that are, quote, inherent in the very enterprise of Jewish scholarship itself, and thus remain unresolved until this very day, be it in Europe, in Israel, or the US. The first tension is that of the relationship between religious and secular approaches, so much disputed between advocates of Jewish theology, such as Abraham Geiger and Zacharias Frankel, on the one hand, and the history and philology-oriented scholars Leopold Zunz or Moritz Steinschneider on the other hand. The second tension refers to the relationship between Wissenschaft and Judaism, between scholarly ethos and Jewish commitment, including the question regarding the involvement of non-Jewish scholars in the discipline. In Michael Meyer's very precise formulation, quote, does Jewish scholarship face inward toward the Jewish community, the Jewish people, and the Jewish religion with the intent of strengthening these, or does it face outward? And if the latter, is, it outward glance, is its outward glance likewise motivated by Jewish concerns, as in the case of apologetics for the sake of emancipation or combating anti-Semitism, or is it directed at integration into the larger academic world with little or no regard for any Jewish connection? Put differently and perhaps a bit crudely, is the goal of Wissenschaft des Judentums Wissenschaft or Judentum? According to Meyer, modern Jewish scholarship has always been Janus-like in this regard, persistently facing in both directions, and apparently this tension is not easy to resolve. Now, rather than presenting firm views on the contemporary American debates, please let me end on a more personal note. As a non-Jewish scholar of Jewish intellectual history in Germany, I am certainly confronted with a completely different context as well as with completely different historical challenges and dilemmas than those addressed by Aaron Hughes. Holding the Martin Buber chair for Jewish religious philosophy in Frankfurt, named in memory of a thinker who represented Jewish thought at my university during the Weimar Republic, before being expelled and driven into exile, there are certainly different questions to be answered. Given the destruction of the tradition of Wissenschaft des Judentums in Nazi Germany, what is the meaning and what is the responsibility of a non-Jewish scholar teaching Jewish thought to non-Jewish students? How can the relationship between Jewish and non-Jewish scholars be defined in a complex situation in which scholarship on Jewish history, literature, culture takes place in varying academic context, institute of Jewish studies, individual chairs in departments of history, theology, literature, or in the new faculty of Jewish theology in Potsdam? And these questions are clearly not easy to answer. I would, however, like to take the opportunity to thank Professor Schorsch uh, for his most thoughtful and generous views on current Jewish studies in Germany, both Jewish and non-Jewish. My personal experience in my international cooperation with so many colleagues in Israel and in the US, and also with colleagues at the different branches of the LBI, is that of a much more open, inclusive, methodologically diverse and interdisciplinary field than it would seem 
from the criticism voice in Aaron Yule's book, a field in which indeed some of the historically rooted tensions persist, causing controversies, but which is nonetheless, nonetheless inspiring, multifaceted, and permeated with an ethos of scholarship as the one embodied by the scholar whose work we are honoring today. Thank you very much. Thank you, Christian, and we will now hear Miam Tulin, uh, who will address the topic, the Wissenschaft and the definition of religiously liberal Jewish identity. Please, Miam. Dear Professor Schorsch, dear ladies and gentlemen, thanks so much for having me here and the opportunity to speak here too and my congratulations to Ismar Schorsch again for the medal you received from this institute. And I'm very happy to speak here. Um, I, I have the great pleasure to, to rely and build on Professor Wiese's considerations because I would like to go in my short presentation, go back to the very nature of Wissenschaft des Judentums as it started in the 1820s in Germany in order to reflect on Jewish religious identity. So the Wissenschaft des Judentums emerged as an academic discipline in the field of, of the humanities. Today it is called Jewish studies, Judaic studies, in Germany we now have Jewish theology, and in Hebrew, Madei Hayadut. The Wissenschaft des Judentums and its subsequent subjects, as well as today Jew, Jewish and Judaic studies, were applying the scientific, the wissenschaftliche approach of philology and history to the remainments of Jewish history and culture. First, and they started as this, to mainly text, later also to objects, music, art, and the like. But it all started with a new and different treatment of Jewish texts. And it is until today connected to this question of a Jewish religious identity. Because the new, the new scientific, wissenschaftlich met method meant and if you have like a text in hand, uh, to, to demand a comparison or extend, uh, to have an extend view on extant manuscript and different versions and sources. The context was determined by the literary hist and historical background which explained why the text was written or the source was created, by whom and what role it played in its society and history. These questions posed in the 19th century by Leopold Zunz and the, his associates have not been posed in traditional Jewish learning before. That was the move, as Ismar Schorsch put it, from text to context. The focus on the context, however, involved from now on a comparative linguistic, historical, and comparative analysis of the text or the source material. This program was set forth, as I said, by Leopold Sunz in the 1820s, and in the end, it, de in de it defined the, mo the work of most of the Jewish scholars ever since. But the study of the Jewish text, the historical, philological criticism of the text, became the one and only method of research in Wissenschaft des Judentums, and also the question for identity because it was a challenge for Jewish scholars in the 19th century. The study um, was, uh, I, I mentioned already the word criticism. You can, you can uh, divide a lower criticism and in, in, you can divide it into a lower and in a higher criticism. The lower criticism is first of all the determination of the correct reading and meaning, like the basic method, the a technique but then comes the higher criticism, the next step built on lower criticism, that means the historical analysis and contextualization and also making conclusions of the text. That was particularly relevant in Bible scholarship but also in Wissenschaft per se. You probably know the essay of, by the second principal of the Jewish Theological Seminary of America, Solomon Schechter, who pointed to the dangers and risks of higher criticism. In his essay, Higher Criticism, Higher Anti-Semitism, he pointed to the origins of higher criticism in Protestant theology and the proto-anti-Semitic theories and approaches in Bible research 
at some parts and at some Protestant scholars. But m what meant the new study of the Jewish text now, the criticism? The three movements or branches in Judaism that emerged during the 19th century and according to them the three branches of Wissenschaftes Judentums can be actually described by the way how they dealt with this higher and lower criticism. For the reform movement, Abraham Geiger is representing this in Germany or in Europe and Isaac Meyer Weiss here in America. Everything was a source, every text existing, Talmud, Torah, it doesn't matter, uh, all Jewish text. Then you have the other side, the orthodox approach, represented by Samson Raphael Hirsch. The Torah, it's he, he thought Torah, it's God's revelation, and you cannot touch, touch it with critical approach. And the same is mainly true for the text of the Jewish tradition, and such as the Talmud. And then we have the middle way, the conservative approach uh, in, in Wissenschaft des Judentums and also in, in the uh, Ju Judaism branch. It's the way between reform and orthodoxy so that the Shora should not be touched. It's sharing the position as, uh, of, Shor of Hirsch, emphasizing, uh, they emphasize the unity of the Torah and mosaic authorship. However, the Talmud and all post-biblical texts can be critically positively, positive historically researched. They do have a development, and this is created by Zacharias Frankel as Glaubenswissenschaft, dog, let's say dogmatic scholarship. So you, you have the broad spectrum of Jewish studies as it developed in the 19th century, the real, reality, so to speak. However, if we return to the fathers of the academic study of Judaism, Leopold Sunz and Moritz Steinschneider, they had a little different ideological or approach to the thinking and meaning of Wissenschaft des Judentums, identity and religion. They were convinced and repeated it constantly that Wissenschaft des Judentums or uh, Jewish studies has much to contribute to the humanities and the history of mankind. Therefore, Jewish studies was to them, to them part and parcel of the general education and universities. Since Wissenschaft des Judentums and Jewish studies were an integral part of world history and literature, it should be, as Steinschneider put it, introduced to everyone, also to the non-Jews, and it should be studied also by non-Jews, and it be, should be open and accessible to everyone. This brings me to the inward and outward meaning of Wissenschaft des Judentums then, but also Jewish studies today, and I'm thankful to Christian Wiese that he already turned to the, referred to the two tansen, tensions within Wissenschaft des Judentums as Michael Meyer described them. So does Wissenschaft des Judentums serve inward, the, the, like the Jewish self-understanding, the Jewish identity, and not least Jewish religion? Or should Wissenschaft serve rather an outward orientation? Meaning, should it be directed towards the societies in which Jews are living? Should it be more interact uh, with related and other sciences? Or, and that would be my question, is it a combination of the two dimensions? Meaning, like Wissenschaft des Judentums then, but also for Jewish studies today. Does it have an inward and outward orientation? This also brings me to the institutions of the academic study of Juda Judaism as they were founded uh, in the 19th century first, outside the universities because of the anti-Semitic ad atmosphere, and I'm thinking of the modern rabbinical seminaries that connected Jewish and secular, let's say, outside knowledge and trained rabbis and Jewish scholars in, let's say, thinking in context. They emerged and were founded since the 1820s. The first was in Padua in Italy, in Europe, and then in America, and became the visible landmarks of the academic study of Judaism and also a network of Jewish scholarship until the Second World War and then after the break uh, onwards. Rabbinical seminaries, uh, such as the Hebrew Union College, founded in 1875 in Cincinnati, and the Jewish Theological Seminary founded here in New York in 1886 
however, and their titles make it already clear that these institutions were designed rather for rabbinical training for educational reasons, and they did not serve the academic study of Judaism in the first place. Therefore, it was a big achievement to have a position for Jewish or Judaic studies at the general university, and it actually happened here in the US for the first time when Harry Ostrin Wolfson became the first chairman for a Judaic, Judaic study center in Harvard. So for Zunz and Steinschneider, that would be a big achievement. Regarding the meaning of the Wissenschaft des Judentums for a religious identity, I would like to quote the, after Zunz, I would say, and also Professor Schorsch uh, told, uh, says this, most, Jewish, most politic Jewish scholar, Simon Dubnov, who said that if you imagine world history and try to think of Jewish history in relation to it, you should understand world history like as a circle, as a globe, and Jewish history crosses the circle like a diameter. The, this points me to the, or this points to the Jewish and the general, the relationship between the Jewish and the general, and also to the two tensions between Jewish, let's say, inside knowledge and at the, and the same time inward orientation on the one side, and on the other side, secular, outside knowledge and outward orientations. They were always, po they were always were moving between the two. As part and parcel of it, the approach to the text and the sources means also a decision for the Jewish scholar and his or her identity. The inward and outward Jew and Jewish and secular does not only define the Jewish scholarly identity, but also a religious Jewish identity then and now, and not least along the lines, if you wish, uh, of, of the movements in Judaism. The connection between Wissenschaft and the religious Jewish identity is not only restricted to scholars, obviously, not only to Wissenschaft rabbis, not only to Dr. Rabina, but also most visible here, there, all together we are gathered and we are not all Dr. Rabina. And the exhibition demonstrates this very impressing upstairs, the ex exhibition on Wissenschaft des Judentums and telling the history of Wissenschaft des Judentums in its context and also refers then to the political implications that were behind until now. Thank you. Thank you, Miriam. And the last speaker of this panel will, by, will be Yitzhak Conforti, who is going to address the impact of the Wissenschaft on Jewish nationalism and Zionism. Um, I also, like my uh, fellows from uh, the CAT Center, want to congratulate Is Isma Shorsh uh, for this uh, great enterprise that you um, have shown all the students of Jewish history all over the world. Um, and I'm going to focus on the Zionist <coughs> reflections on uh, the on the vision of the student tools. Um, now, Jewish nationalism and Zionism in particular uh, criticize, as you all know, the agenda and the aspiration of uh, the vision of the student tools as it developed in Germany in the 19th century. Uh, for Zionist scholars, the vision scholars from the 19th century adopted a universal idea of Judaism. They uh, neglected the uh, uh, national component of Jewish history and uh, 
didn't use the Hebrew language as the major language for research. All this for political uh, aspiration of assimilation and integration in, in Germany. The Zionist turn to history, if I may use Ismar Scholl's uh, turn to history regarding the Wissenschaft, um, and the creation of the, the Zionist historical consciousness was an essential element in all fraction of Zionist, uh, uh, in the Zionist movement uh, in order to mold uh, Jewish identity and national identity. Uh, the Zionist movement expressed a rebellion against the Jewish past, but at the same time, they aspired to inherit and the, this, uh, the Jewish past and Jewish diaspora and as they usually saw themselves as the legitimate successor, successor of, of Jewish diaspora. As you can see here in this uh, uh, picture from 1901, a very known one, you can see the diaspora negation uh, in its visual, visual uh, expression. You can see the old man here by Ephraim Lillian, the old, the old man, the, the old Jew representing diaspora, and uh, uh, the young farmer goes toward the light or the promised land representing Zionism, representing the, the, new, the new Jew. In regard to the Wissenschaft and the relations of Zionists toward the Wissenschaft, on the one hand, Zionist scholars rejected the ideology and the agenda of the Wissenschaft des Judentums, but on the other hand, they adopted the scientific standards and res uh, of, for research of, Jew of the Jewish past. Therefore, Jewish science in Eastern Europe, uh, known by the name, the Hebrew term, Chochmat Israel, did not erect an, uh, such an antagonism within the Zionist camp. On the contrary, the national historiography enterprise of Simon Dubnov uh, uh, in the end of the, of the 19th century uh, paved the way for the Zionist historiography as it developed in Palestine from the 1920s uh, and, and on. Furthermore, uh, Zionism embraced moderate scholarship like those of uh, uh, Ranak, Nachman Krochmal, and his successor, Shir, Shmuel Yehuda Rappaport from Prague and Shmuel David Lusato Shadal from Italy. Why? Because they all used the Hebrew language in their research. And they uh, did not neglect the national component in Jewish history. For, so for Zionist uh, scholars, these three main uh, uh, points were very uh, much important. The Hebrew language, the use of the Hebrew language, Jewish national fraternity and unity when you are looking toward the past, and uh, the importance of or the centrality of the land of Israel. Now, our start, starting point uh, in, in this regard will be uh, Peretz Molensky, which in his uh, Ashachar, uh, published in Hebrew in, uh, 18, uh, in 1861, uh, uh, he argued that the use of the Hebrew language is critical not only for molding Jewish nationalism, but also in, in, in order to understand correctly the Jewish past. Uh, so, as you can see here, at the fir in, in, in first uh, manifesto of Ashachar from 1868, Smolenskin emphasized the need uh, to use the Hebrew language in order to, to uh, arouse nationalism. Why to use Hebrew language? It will give us the, the bone to be called Israel. And afterward, at the bottom paragraph, you can see that afterwards, when he criticized the, uh, the uh, scholars uh, or the Wissenschaft scholars in Germany, he basically criticized their approach in using the Germany as the major language of research. This is for him was very misleading and causes uh, many, uh, as you can see, lies, falsehood, and uh, endless nonsense. Why? 
because works like Gretz and, and Geiger from the 70s were, in, in his eyes, very misleading. Uh, Ahad Aam, the leader uh, of uh, cultural Zionism and the most prominent leader of Eastern Jewry at that time, also opposed the Jewish science in Germany. For him, uh, Jewish Wissenschaft works signifies the, law, uh, the, the loss of the hope in, in Jewish future. Uh, in his view, Jewish studies in Germany were meant to serve uh, the memories of the past, like an old age game, uh, while he wanted to use the Jewish past in order to, uh, uh, to create the future. As you can see uh, at the upper paragraph, between the new prayer service with no mention of the, the future and the new literature on the history of the past, there is an inner psychological connection uh, uh, and relationship. So for Ahad Am, the, the main point of Wissenschaft, or Chochmat Israel, is to, uh, to reveal the national self. From the 19-teens onwards, excuse me, uh, the most important uh, figure in this, in this regard was Chaim Nachman Bialik, which is, uh, which uh, founded with, uh, along with uh, Yoshua Hanorovnitsky, uh, publishing companies such as Moria and later on Dvir, and uh, he published the Book of Legends, Sefer Agada. Uh, in his speech in 1913, entitled The Hebrew Book, he conveyed his vision for literary gathering of the Hebrew uh, book. Bialik pointed out that the need to collect, to preserve, and to learn Hebrew books and classical sources of Judaism from all periods of time. This vision inspired many Zionist scholars, among them the most uh, known maybe is Ben Sion Dino with his uh, collection of uh, sources, Israel Bagola. Uh, Bialik called it Mif'al uh, Kinus or the Khatima. So here you can see some of, uh, I don't want to, to, uh, to read it, but you can see it. As shown, these Zionist thinkers aspired to facilitate national identity, both on Jewish history. For them, Zionism evolved from the history of the Jews in, let's say, in an evolutionary manner, which is the Zionism is the culmination of history. However, other Zionist uh, thinkers view Zionism as a revolution rather than evolution. Most important in this regard is uh, this uh, well-known guys. Uh, uh, David Ben-Gurion and Yitzhak Ben-Zvi emphasized the centrality of the land of Israel uh, and the diaspora negation principle in Zionism. They argued that the research of Jewish past should focus mainly on the land of Israel Case in point is the book that you can see at the bottom, or to the right on the bottom, uh, Eretz Israel Ba'avar Ba'oveh, which is the uh, Eretz Israel Past and Present, in which the territorial dimension in Jewish history played a central role. Yitzhak Ben Tzvi investigated the Jewish settlement uh, that remained in Palestine throughout the years of diaspora. For him, they were the, uh, um, the historical truth, so to speak, for the etern eternal connection between the Jewish people and the Jewish homeland. So in one of his uh, um, studies, he said, the line connecting the, the entire nation, where, 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 wherever it was, to its homeland was never broken, not for one moment in the history of our people, and the thin strands of remnant issue served as a living evident channel for this eternal connection. Ben Zvi uh, demonstrated this argument in his very well-known uh, research about a little village northern in uh, the northern village of Pekin. Uh, another show she knows what I mean, uh, <laughs> Stefan. Uh, so Pekin is a little vi a village uh, uh, in uh, the upper Galilee. Um, he found the family that uh, never went out to diaspora and he made out of it a, a very big deal and he became later on the president of the, this little community. So for, from this argumentation of Yitzhak Ben Tzvi and David Ben Gurion following the philosophy of Mikhail Sergodichevsky, 
one can conclude that the Jewish life in the diaspora was less important than the history of the Jewish homeland and its little communities that left toward the Galu uh, throughout the Galut. But Dichevsky, Ben Gurion, and Ben Zvi uh, embraced the big step or the big leap in history, or as David Ben Gurion loved to call it, we are uh, going from the Tanakh to the Palmach. All, 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 all in the middle is not so important for us. <laughs> now, what is the question here? Can, can we say that Zionist historians follow this lead? Zionist historians such as uh, Ben Zion Dino and Yitzhak Ber and Gershom Sholem try to reconstruct the Jewish past as a nation's history and not as a religious community. Therefore, they also criticize the German Jewish studies and uh, universalist uh, view. We all know uh, the harsh criticism of Gershom Sholem in his uh, uh, article from 1944 uh, calling the, uh, the Wissenschaft and specifically Steinschneider and, and uh, Zunz as uh, grave, uh, grave diggers or, or uh, frightening burial, burial ceremony of Jewish culture, but I, I don't want to focus on them. I want to uh, go to the, the, the historians. Two major historians uh, are Ben Zion Dinur and Yitzhak Ber, uh, the leader of Zionist historiography from the 30s, called to abandon the, the, the apologetic approach of Jewish history, namely to research Jewish history from within in order to understand the real intention of past generations in their own terms. As we can see uh, in the opening manifesto of Zion of 1936, they call to uh, Jewish history is the history of the Jewish people, not the Jewish religion. And you can see also that Jewish history uh, has to be dealt as a, a, in, in its unity. As an uh, you cannot look at Jewish past just about the communities, but you have to, to look at, at the national uh, component. It should be noted that Zionist historians in, in Jerusalem did not share the usually, not, not all of them, uh, the revolutionary stance uh, of Ben-Gurion and ben -Zvi. Therefore, they followed the evolutionary uh, view of Jewish history by Hadam and Bialik and Smolensky. Their scientific approach was based on German romantic historiography of Leopold, uh, Leopold Franke and, its, and, and his successors like Meineke. The, uh, the rejection of the diaspora negation uh, principle within the Zionist historiography became even more evident uh, in the second generation of uh, Zionist historians from the 1950s and the 1960s. I uh, want to refer to one of the important historians, Chaim Ilen Ben Sasson, the, the, the author and, uh, ed and the editor of the important book uh, about Jewish history called in Hebrew, Toldot Am Israel, uh, which published in 1969, and he uh, uh, he attacked the dominant uh, uh, discourse in the state of Israel in the two first decades of the states. To him, the glorification of the Sabra native figure, uh, alongside the admiration for biblical archaeology, which was very uh, uh, publicly known in the first two decades uh, of the state of Israel. You know that uh, Yigal Yadin, the, the, the uh, chief of staff, uh, became the uh, most important archeologist and he was very well connected to uh, Ben-Gurion and ben uh, together. Uh, um, so for Chaim Hillel Ben Sasson, this was uh, very dangerous to, to combine Jewish history from Zionism directly to the golden age of the, the, the biblical time with, uh, with, with no regard to, to, um, to the history of the Jews in diaspora. So uh, he said in 1976, if you examine the map of Eretz Israel, no matter which territories you study, it proves that most of the time from the seventh century until the beginning of the Zionism, we did not live in Eretz Israel. I will, I will add one thing. Zionism did not begin because the Jews lived in, the, in Pkein, as uh, Yitzhak Ben Svi says, but because the Jews lived in Bialystok and longed for Eretz Israel. So in Ben Sasson's view, Zionism developed out of Jewish spiritual consciousness uh, and longing for Zion.
I want to end with uh, Jacob Katz, one of the most influential Zionist historians in the second half of the 20th century, actually the, the Jewish historians, not just the Zionist historian. In his last book, public uh, just after he passed away, uh, he concluded his entire career, he pointed out that the history of the, uh, that in history there are some events that should, uh, should be understood by long duration or long durée approach, uh, and not merely in the immediate uh, historical context. He refers specifically to the Holocaust as such an event and to the establishment of the State of Israel as such long duration phenomenon. In both cases, said Katz, there are long-term factors embedded in the depth of Jewish history. The Holocaust is the culmination of Jewish hatred in, Christi in uh, Christiani uh, Christianity for 2,000 years, and the State of Israel is connected to the Jews, to Jewish aspirations since antiquity to return to the land of Israel. As, uh, as we saw, Zionist historians did not share the radical evolutionary position uh, of some of the leaders. They followed the evolutionary stance which uh, viewed Zionism as a culmination of Jewish history. And regardless, uh, and, uh, regardless the uh, uh, ideological differences between Zionism and the visage of the Judentums, Zionist historiography uh, approach can be traced back to the early uh, 19th century uh, enterprise of Jewish academic studies. They actually uh, more uh, successors than rebellion. And I want to uh, uh, take this opportunity again to thank uh, Ismail Shor for his uh, great uh, enterprise and teaching us all about uh, Jewish history. Thank you very much. Yes, thank you to all the three panelists. Uh, I'm afraid to say that we are nearly running out of time, but I would suggest that we follow a, a, a tradition that we've developed at the Cut Center, that we collect uh, questions of three. Unfortunately, there will only be one group, so <laughs> please go ahead. Please, Michael and the gentleman, and maybe a third. Yeah, please. Okay, thank you. I think that might be a question for Christian, Michael.
Thank you, Michael. <laughs> Unfortunately, I will not be able uh, um, to um, have more than three questions. Please, the gentleman in the back. Okay, so all three speakers are encouraged to be very brief in their <laughs> answers. Christian. Yes, well, with regard to the first question, I have to be very brief because <laughs> it is really not easy to answer. I mean, the, uh, the Protestant tradition, of course, uh, especially the Protestant tradition very much relies on texts, the Bible, and uh, it kind of excludes uh, notions of uh, the further development of tradition by uh, by oral tradition. So uh, from the Reformation era and certainly even stronger from the Enlightenment period in the 19th century, philological works uh, on the text is the main basis of Protestant scholarship. And one could discuss how influential <laughs> this is with regard to the development of Wissenschaft des Judentums, how much uh, orientation was there on, on uh, the part of Jewish scholars uh, with regard to this strong focus on philology. Uh, but this is something that probably Ismar <laughs> would be much better suited to, to respond, uh, whether or not there is still a rest of, um, of uh, thought about the oral tradition left uh, in this specific tradition. And uh, should, yeah. should I respond to the second question immediately? Um, I certainly um, feel that not being able to write a book or an article uh, in Hebrew by myself is uh, an important issue. I mean, reading, reading work is something else and understanding talks, and, uh, but not being able to write a book or an article in Hebrew myself is certainly uh, uh, an element. Um, and um, one aspect would be to have one's work translated into Hebrew to make it accessible to an Hebrew leader readership, but this is nothing that actually happens because most of the Israeli scholars uh, I'd rather read it in English than, uh, than in Hebrew. And um, so whenever I try to have, let's say, my book on Hazionas translated into Hebrew, the response is, why? It's out there in English. Why aren't you? <laughs> yeah, actually, I feel the same. I try to read and keep up with the Hebrew scholarship, mostly and, and more easily. Obviously, is, it is possible if you just go into the National Library in Jerusalem and talk to the people who explain you the work and discuss it with you. And, but, but actually, the, 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 I just uh, had a revelation for myself because my first article in Hebrew uh, appeared together in a an, uh, an volume also co uh, Andreas contributed. And I, it was a strange and, and a fascinating feeling at the same time. I saw myself, my name in, in Hebrew and in this, in this volume, it was the, su such a long article. They complained about this. Germans are speak <laughs> writing always so much and too many footnotes, but it was, they, I think they did it well, as far as I can say. But it, um, actually, the, the, the language situation uh, I experience in Jewish studies is very much that English is the koine, so, yeah. so to speak. And also, between us, it's always like the neutral, neutral ground. I absolutely agree. We have here a, a great opportunity at the Cat Center to cross borders in this regard of language. Uh, we had a wonderful experience uh, last week when we re uh, write, uh, we read together in a reading group, text of Sholem, which is published firstly in Hebrew and then uh, translated to the Germany. 
and uh, all of us try to uh, cross the, these borders, but uh, to the question if, if the Hebrew is limiting uh, you to be unbiased, I'm not sure. Uh, it's limiting the, uh, the audience, of course, and uh, I think that uh, past 20 years, of course, many uh, Israeli scholars try to to come to the to Germany or to the U.S. and to to overcome this uh, language barrier in order to extend their uh, knowledge. Uh, in regard to post-Zionism uh, or the debates in Israel, well, of course, it's uh, part of the the discourse. Uh, you cannot avoid uh, uh, intellectual uh, um, developing or the intellectual uh, uh, talks uh, while you're writing about Jewish history. But if you want to be a real scholar, you should, uh, you know, you should distance yourself from, from this kind of noises that uh, uh, any time come across you. Uh, so this is not just a problem. This is uh, a, even uh, a powerful engine to growth of Jewish uh, studies. I, I'm, I'm not sure that uh, post-Zionism in the 90s, be, uh, started in the 90s, uh, uh, make a decline in Jewish history because it's also uh, developed to in other areas, not just Jewish history, but political uh, scientists in, in Israel and so on and so forth. So this is a challenge. Like any other challenge, uh, if you are really want to focus in Jewish history, keep your eyes on the ball, okay? <laughs> Thank you. So um, we'll take a short break, and instead of applauding the three speakers, I kindly invite you to once more applaud to Isma. <laughs> I'd like to welcome you to the second session. Uh, my name is David Sorkin, uh, and it's my great pleasure uh, to, um, to chair this second session. Um, I'd like to start with a very brief tribute to Ismar Shorsh uh, as a mentor of students. When I was a graduate student at University of California, Berkeley, I. Uh, wrote a dissertation prospectus. Uh, I wanted to write my, a dissertation on German Jewish history in the late 18th and early 19th centuries. Uh, out of the blue, I sent it to Ismar Shorsh, whose work I greatly admired. Um, he happened to be coming to California for a, an academic conference. I went to his panel at that conference. And after that, after that panel, he spent well over an hour with me. Uh, helping me to refine my thinking, but above all, encouraging me and telling me how important the subject was. So uh, that's my tribute to Ismar Shorsh, who is clearly one of the giants uh, in the field. Uh, the panel this afternoon is on Wissenschaftes Judentums in Contemporary Jewish Culture. Uh, it's organized according to different media. Uh, each of our panelists will represent how Knowledge, of the, knowledge or the academic study of Judaism is disseminated or transmitted in a different medium. Uh, now I'll follow the practice of this morning and not give you biographies since you have those on your sheet. Uh, our first speaker will be Gavriel Rosenfeld uh, who teaches at Fairfield uh, University. Uh, he's written on history, his field is the history and memory of Nazi Germany uh, and the Holocaust, and he's written a number of important books. Uh, I should also note that um, Gavriel studied with me when he was a freshman at Brown University, a course on the, I, I took a course with me on the history of European anti-Semitism and the Holocaust. I've never taught that course again, not because of Gavriel. Um, <laughs> um, and he's going to talk to us today uh, about um, a work which he's edited on counterfactual history, uh, which is entitled, If Only We Had Died in Egypt, What Ifs of Jewish History from Abraham to Zionism?
Thank you so much, David, uh, for the introduction. Thanks for the reminiscence of my uh, course with you uh, on anti-Semitism, which was a wonderful class. I still have all the notes from it. Um, you're welcome to borrow them if you ever decide to teach the class again. I'd also like to extend my congratulations to Professor Schorsch. Um, and with respect to the topic today, I'm not sure if uh, he would appreciate it, nor am I sure that any of the practitioners of the Wissenschaft des Judentums in the 19th century would have appreciated it, because in a way it's the antithesis of the scientific study of anything, namely the uh, study of counterfactuals or what-ifs in Jewish history. Uh, as David just mentioned, later this year um, I have a new edited collection of essays on the subject um, coming out with Cambridge University Press. That includes 16 separate contributions by leading scholars, uh, Jewish scholars in the fields of history, religious studies, and literature. And while I won't uh, detail each of the 16 uh, topics, let me just give you a little bit of a cross-section to show you how wide-ranging they are. The uh, essays include, and Steve Weitzman is where? Steve, he's uh, the first uh, contributor. What if the Exodus had never happened? What if the Second Temple in Jerusalem had never been destroyed? What if the Jews of Spain had never been expelled in 1492? What if Jews had never been confined to the Pale of Settlement in Russia? What if Franz Kafka had immigrated to Palestine in 1924? What if Adolf Hitler had been assassinated in 1939? Now that's, what is it, seven. Uh, there are nine others. I can assure you that each of them has been produced by an expert in their field. Um, and they should, of course, raise a bunch of different questions. And I don't know whether anyone will accept the answers, but uh, they're meant to be provocative. So what do they all do, and why is any of this relevant? These and many other questions included in the volume explore how the alteration of a key variable, or what's oftentimes known as a point of divergence, would have made the course of Jewish history different. Many of you, of course, may be wondering what the point is of conducting such an intellectual exercise, and if you're wondering that, you would be in good company. Because traditionally, most historians have looked down upon what-if questions and derided them or at least uh, viewed them with great skepticism. Now that said, and we could uh, certainly go through the long list of historians who have come out in opposition to counterfactuals, it's safe to say that in the last generation, the use of counterfactual reasoning has in fact become a major trend within the Western historical profession. Many monographs and edited collections have appeared in recent years, most notably published by or edited by Neil Ferguson. Uh, his book, Virtual History from 1997, sort of was pioneering in this regard. Most recently, by the way, last year, uh, Richard Evans, uh, launched a very fierce diatribe against counterfactual history, of course, further underscoring its relevance. That said, I would argue uh, that in Jewish history, and certainly in Jewish studies thus far, counterfactual history has not been embraced, nor has it been really accepted at all. And so I'm hoping in this forthcoming volume to uh, amend this state of affairs and to further provoke Jewish historians to ask what if. So in the limited time that I have, I'd just like to preview two chief points. Number one, I'd like to ask the question, which I sort of investigate at length in the introduction to the volume, why have Jewish historians been so late to the party? Why have they only of late decided to embrace counterfactual questions? And second of all, I'd like to ask, or at least show, how asking what if questions can enrich our understanding of the Jewish past. And I will at the end draw a little bit on the Wissenschaft des Judentums movement. David Myers is well known for having pointed out some years ago that Jewish historians have traditionally been uh, late rather than early adopters of new methodological innovations in the realm of scholarship. But without getting into that topic any further, I would sort of like to suggest that there may be deeper forces in the Jewish intellectual tradition that have discouraged asking what if. In my book's introduction, for instance, I point out that there are very few historical what ifs in the Hebrew Bible. The exception that proves the rule appears in chapter 16 in the book of Exodus that in fact gives my book its title. At this point in the biblical narrative, as we're all aware, the Israelites have just made their way out of Egypt following the destruction of Pharaoh's army in the Sea of Reeds. They're on their way to the Promised Land, but three days into their journey, they start to lose patience and they begin to kvetch. The wilderness is bleak, they don't have any food, they don't have any water, and they eventually lament to Moses, and here I quote directly, if only we had died. If only we had died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt when we sat by the flesh pots when we ate our fill of bread. Now this is the first counterfactual utterance in the Hebrew Bible. How should we make sense of it? The most important thing I would argue is to understand its function. At the most basic level, the Israelites' exclamation about the precarious present contains an implicit assumption about an alternate past. It suggests, of course, that the course of history would have been better if they had stayed in Egypt all along. The exclamation reveals, in fact, that all counterfactual claims are presentist in the sense that they reflect contemporary concerns. This particular passage from Exodus illustrates how discontent with the present 
can prompt fantasies about improving the past. I would, however, also like to point out that the opposite can be true. A sense of satisfaction with the present can encourage visions of the past turning out worse. These are the classic differences between fantasy scenarios and nightmare scenarios. To once again cite the Jewish religious tradition, the medieval song Dayenu, which we heard earlier uttered, not the whole song, but a reference to it, in somebody else's comments, celebrates God for delivering the Israelites very famously from Egyptian bondage. And as the many verses, of course, intone, the song repeatedly speculates that if God had been of less assistance, for example, if he had brought us out, brought us before Mount Sinai, but not given us the Torah, it still would have been enough for us. The message, in other words, is clear. In reciting the different ways in which the course of history might have turned out worse, those who sing the song express gratitude for their present day reality. These two examples from the Jewish religious tradition show how pivotal events in history, here of course taken from the Israelites' liberation from slavery, can inspire counterfactual speculation. And yet, I would like to argue these examples are exceptional. Compared to other cultural and religious traditions, Jewish thinking has at least traditionally seemed averse to counterfactual speculation. This becomes especially clear in comparing Jewish historical consciousness to that of the Greeks and Romans. The roots of counterfactual thinking in the Western historical tradition, as we all know, trace back to the work of Herodotus and Thucydides, both of whom raised what-ifs, very famous what-ifs, in the context of the Persian Wars and the Peloponnesian War. Other historians, such as Tacitus, Livy, Plutarch, and Polybius, did as well. So why did the Greeks and Romans embrace counterfactuals? Here I'd like to draw on the scholarship of Amos Funkenstein and Arnaldo Momigliano, who argued that Greek and Roman historiography was open to what-ifs. Why? Because it was not deterministic and lacked any teleological dimensions. According to the Greek polytheistic worldview, the Greeks believed that the gods were constantly at war with each other and that historical events were not headed towards any specific outcome. Instead, chaos was the norm. Moreover, Greek and Roman historians quite early on embraced models of secular causality and understood that human and not solely divine forces shaped historical events. And I realize, of course, I'm being somewhat schematic here, but by contrast, Jewish historical consciousness seems to have been more deterministic. Both biblical and rabbinic texts regarded historical events as reflection of divine will. History's course was a barometer of God's commitment to the Jewish people, which varied according to their own level of commitment to the divine covenant. And so all of the Jews' historical setbacks and their achievements were interpreted by the prophets as reflections of Jewish moral failings or ensuing and ensuing repentance. This perspective helped to solidify a Jewish view of history that was teleological, proceeding towards the end of days and the coming of the Messiah. And as many historians of counterfactual history love to point out, any historical tradition that's deterministic tends to discourage believing in the role of contingency, chance, and things turning out otherwise. This absence of a counterfactual mindset, I argue, continued into the rabbinic and medieval periods. During these centuries, of course, as Yosef Chaim Yerushalmi pointed out in Zahor, Jews showed very little interest in secular historical inquiry and continued to use biblical archetypes to make sense of present day events. Only with the dawn of the 19th century, finally, did Jews finally return to the modern writing of history, with the rise, of course, of the modern scientific uh, pursuit of Wissenschaftes Judentums, all of which, uh, all of whose work focused rather on secular rather than divine causes in the crafting of historical narratives. Now, having said that, I think it's also worth noting that Jewish historiography preserved a teleological orientation, albeit in a secular form. Jewish historians oftentimes impose totalizing narratives upon the Jewish past in order to give it a sense of unity. The Wissenschaftes Judentum scholars such as Isaac Marcus Joost or Leopold Zuntz historicized the evolution of Judaism, as we've heard today, as a spiritual idea, believing, of course, that doing so would promote the goals of religious reform and civil emancipation. Later on, Heinrich Gretz and Shimon Dubnov took a more nationalistic turn and focused on the development of the Jews as an independent people, believing that asserting Jewish nationhood would bring political benefits to the Jews of Central and Eastern Europe. And then, of course, Zionist historians such as Yitzchak Baer represented Jewish history as a long struggle between Galut and nationhood. All of these historians' ideological tendencies may have, I argue, made them less open to the play of chance and contingency. And for this reason, when you survey the works of 19th century Jewish historians and early 20th century ones such as Saul Baron as well, one really doesn't find many counterfactual references. Unlike, it's important to note, non-Jewish scholars such as, dating back to the late 18th century, Edward Gibbon, and then the 19th century, Jacob Burkhardt, G.M. Trevelyan, Arnold Toynbee, John Stuart Mill, and Max Weber. 
This absence of a speculative tendency was also visible in the realm of counterfactual literature, not history, but fiction, where non-Jewish European and American writers dominated the production of works of alternate history in the 19th and 20th centuries. Only in the years after the Second World War, and really since the 1970s, have Jewish writers of fiction become prominent in the realm of alternate history, and one can certainly point to uh, famous novels since the turn of the millennium, such as Philip Roth's The Plot Against America and Michael Chabon's The Yiddish, Yiddish Policeman's Union, not to mention the dozens of books by Harry Turtledove, Turtledove rather, that illustrate this larger point. In any case, uh, if we assume that this is correct, that the Jewish counterfactual impulse has been minimal for most of Jewish history, why should we change? Why should we pursue anything new in a what-if fashion? I argue in the volume and more generally that asking what-ifs can enrich our historical knowledge in three ways. If we ask what-if, if we pursue counterfactuals, we can deepen our understanding of historical causality, we can further understand how to draw moral conclusions, and we can spend quite a bit of time learning about how history transforms into memory. In other words, it's about causality, morality, and memory. So in the 90 seconds that I have to bear this out, let me simply say that in order to understand how things happened, how it was that X caused Y, we also have to be aware of the fact that Y would not have happened without X. So if we, for example, want to understand why the American army won the war in the Pacific against Japan, we could certainly say that the dropping of the atomic bombs on Hiroshima and Nagasaki helped end the war. Were they decisive, however, in terms of causality? Only by asking what would have happened if the bombs hadn't been dropped, and of course American planners mulled this over quite a bit and had estimated casualty tolls that would have ensued without the dropping of the bombs, only then can we truly understand why events happen by asking what if. If we moreover want to investigate the morality of the dropping of these bombs, we also have to ask the question, what would have happened had we not dropped them? Was it immoral to have ended the war as it was in August of 1945, or should the war have dragged on for three, six, nine more months with the ensuing casualties of more American soldiers and Japanese soldiers, and civilians for that matter? Was it moral or immoral? Only by asking what if can we conclude. Finally, as I tell my students in my counterfactual history seminar every other year, if we really want to understand how people remember the past, explore how they imagine it having turned out differently. If we want to understand why it is that sometimes people construct nightmares and other times people imagine fantasies, it's always the case that these various visions of the past that never was reflects an awareness of how it actually turned out to be. And so the volume that's going to be forthcoming uh, later this year, hopefully it will be a nice, uh, I don't want to mix my metaphors, Hanukkah stocking stuffer for people who might be interested, uh, will certainly prove or bear out the idea that this book will be a reflection of its times because all 16 of the contributors very much bring presentist goals to their analyses. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Gavriel. Our second speaker is Annie Polland, uh, who is Vice President of Education and Programs at the Lower East Side Tenement Museum in New York. Uh, she's the author of a number of books uh, and I'm also happy to, to say had the privilege, I had the privilege of teaching her modern Jewish history as an undergraduate at the University of Wisconsin. Thank you so much. Thank you for inviting me. It's an honor to be here. Um, it's an honor to be here, although a little bit of a surprise um, in the sense that my understanding of Wissenschaft um, and the practitioners of Wissenschaft, uh, both historically and today, um, focus mostly on, on intellectuals and um, texts. And the Tenement Museum is a place that has tailors and glaziers and cigar rollers, um, housewives and children. So how did, you know, in, in, in the Tenement Museum very much came out of the idea of, of social history. Um, and at the same time, I, I have to say that the founders of the Tenement Museum really didn't envision the Tenement Museum as a Jewish institution or a Jewish museum. Um, as you can see by the mission statement, the word Jewish isn't anywhere in, in the statement. And in many ways, the Jews who live there and the stories um, that they tell and that they have are kind of subsumed under the category of immigrant or categories of working class and others. But Telling a Jewish story was not the express goal of the founders of the Tenement Museum in, in 1988. That said, 
Um, it can be argued that the Tenement Museum today is one of the most popular Jewish sites, historical sites in, um, in New York City and, and perhaps in the country. We have every year about 210,000 visitors and we would have more, but we just can't fit any more in the tenement space. Um, in fact, we're expanding in order to um, accommodate the, um, the demand for the tours. Um, so we have a, a vibrant institution and one in which, although this was not the founder's intention, many are indeed hearing um, about Jewish history as they go through the tenement. Why? Because the majority of the people who lived in the tenement, which was built in 1863, um, were Jewish. One way the founders of the museum were able to tell a much more diverse story was by, a, was by expanding the period of significance. Most historic houses that you visit will pick one moment in time or a one decade in time to kind of to focus on. The Tenement Museum um, did not do that. The Tenement Museum said its period of significance was uh, almost 70 years, 1863, or beyond over 70 years, 1863 to 1935, the period at which, uh, from which it was built and it was inhabited uh, by residents until 1935. The, by doing that, they were able to move away from a story that, say, focused on 1900, which would mean it would only be Jewish um, immigrants they would be talking about, um, to going uh, earlier in time allows them to tell a German immigrant story and by going all the way to the 1930s allows them to tell an Italian story as well. Thrown in there in the early years are also Irish stories. So you have a much more diverse um, picture of immigrant life because they're looking at different eras in the building's history. But as the tenements, as they've been created, and the different tenements, there are six recreated apartments. Um, one is a Sephardic Jewish family, two are East European Jewish families, one is a German Jewish family, and then there's an Irish family and an Italian family. There are two commercial spaces that also have been um, recreated. One is a German Lutheran store, and the other store, um, storefront, through the use of technology, actually tells three East European Jewish stories. So almost every one of the um, visitors, of the 210,000 visitors, has some element of Jewish history woven into their experience at the Tenement Museum. Um, this is the hallway of the Tenement, and I think one of the opportunities that we have in telling Jewish history um, in this space is that it is a space, and it's an immersive space. And the vast majority of people who go through the tenement are not going to pick up the texts that are written by the fine scholars located in this building, uh, that are housed in this building or in other libraries. Um, but being in these spaces, they're awakened to history. They ask questions about history. Um, they, their curiosity is inspired, and they're really able to engage in history. So what are we able to talk about in this hallway? We're able to talk about progressive reformers who argued for the need for light, for the need for um, bathrooms and running water. People are able to experience this hallway with the light turned off and they can see what it was like before the 1901 housing law was passed. So there are so many issues that people are now able to experience in a very um, immersive and a very in a tactile way as well. Um, this is the story of, of Natalie Gumpertz, who lived in the tenement um, in the 1870s and into the 1880s, and she was a Prussian Jewish immigrant who came over. Her husband, Isaac, um, I'm sorry, her husband, Julius Gumpertz, was a, a shoemaker, and in the 1870 census, it shows that she's living there with four children. In 1874, um, Julius left for work. He worked at a, a shoe factory, and he never came back. So Natalie Gumberts is left with the four children and the need to support the children. And so the story is told in this space and people can kind of understand what, Nat uh, what Natalie's what life would be like. Whether or not she loved her husband doesn't matter when you think about what it was like the next day where she had to figure out a way to still support the children in this space and who could she turn to for help. And this is where texts become extremely important. Though people are in spaces, it's the texts and the study of primary sources that the visitors engage with that bring the stories to life and have them really interact with history. Um, 
as I mentioned earlier, the census is the kind of the Bible of the Tenement Museum. It's a census through which we're able to kind of understand who was living in the building at what time, with how many children, what were their occupations, and a variety of stories emerge simply from looking at that census. Looking at the census in the spaces that they lived makes the power of the story so much more important when one understands that 12 people in one family were in a space no larger than 325 square feet. This um, text that I'm sharing here actually came from this building, um, is part of the uh, collection at YIVO that tells the story of the United Hebrew Charities. Um, the United Hebrew Charities opened an office in 1874 on East 4th Street um, to help people who were hit by the panic of 1873 and to help, as the title implies, the United Hebrew Charities, um, specifically Jewish population. Um, this building housed the records, or still housed the records, of the United Hebrew Charities, and we were able to look through it and find that indeed the Gumperts received help. Um, this actual entry is from very early on in their, their period at the Tenement Museum, and at, um, this is from 1870, but it shows that Julius and Rosalia, her name was actually Natalia, um, received um, help, although it says assist only occasionally. Um, later on, it becomes clear that the United Hebrew Charities also gives Natalie, uh, or we think gives Natalie a sewing machine so that she could support herself once her husband had deserted. Um, and indeed, she becomes a dressmaker. So these texts are very important because beyond the entries that I have here, you have a picture of who was helped. Um, and this is really important because people who come to the Tenement Museum, and I would say people even beyond the Tenement Museum tend to think of German Jews as Jews with money because that is part of the collective history. Here, in this record book, you see that the Jews living in Klein Deutschland, or what was then, uh, what the Lower East Side was then called, were people who needed help. There were painters who fell off ladders and could no longer support their family. Um, there were people who, a husband went to jail, a husband deserted, um, a wife <coughs> deserted. And so there are all sorts of situations that come up in this book that gives you a sense of the social history and the context of the people who lived in the building. Um, and this is the, the tenement apartment of Harris and Jenny Levine. Um, and Harris was a dressmaker. And different documents have helped us piece together his story, um, that he had four people working with him in that space to produce dresses that he raised, he and Jenny raised five children in the very same space, 325 square feet. Um, we're also able to tell from documents that they rested on Sunday, or they rested on the Sabbath and worked on Sunday. Um, and we're able to tell the story here of how immigrant Jews, when they worked in the contracting system in the 1890s, the garment industry was run through the contract system, were able to choose the days that they worked. And indeed, in the 1890s, many of the tailors who lived there decided to rest on um, Saturday as opposed to Sunday. Um, and this is the Lusgarden family, a family of butchers who lived in the low level, the, the basement level, rather, of the Tenement Museum. And they ran a, a butcher store. And you can tell from their faces that they weren't always thrilled about running the butcher store. And, and one of the things that, that impressed us the most just in seeing this image is the fact that everyone in the image is wearing an apron, indicating the importance of the family's labor to the success of the, um, of the business. In 1902, their butcher store, located at 97 Orchard Street, was attacked by rioting women who were incensed uh, at a 50% increase in the price of kosher meat. Um, and so we see here, um, these are women listening to a boycott appeal. What we also have, although it's not included in this presentation, is a picture from the New York Sun of 97 Orchard Street, the window broken by, by vandals um, as part of, of the protest. So in this space, we're able to tell the story of a consumer boycott that was incredibly important in shaping the neighborhood, not just shaping the neighborhood, but shaping the perceptions of the broader neighborhood of, of the, the city of the East European Jews that were living there. Um, this is from the Forverts, um, the, the might of the women, the power of the women, showing how the women stood up to the kosher meat trust. Um, and these are actually quotes from Uptown Papers that in many ways sympathized, although many of the first reports of these newspapers um, attacked the women who were rioting, um, attacking their methods and, and calling them violent and, and using uh, words that, that made them seem almost animal in behavior. Other 
as the, as the strike went on, other reports of it showed the kind of efficiency of the women um, and the business acumen that they had. Um, and it also pointed out the role they had in the family economy as the accountants of the family. Um, and finally, this room is the, the Rogoshevsky apartment, and I included it with a text. Um, one of the advantages of being in a space, as opposed to being in a um, traditional museum with wall text, is that we're able to tell and we're able to change the story as historiography develops. Um, so one of the things we did recently, or within the last few years, is with the help of other historians, um, and all of our exhibits are crafted with um, historians and sociologists. This one, um, tells the story of the Rogoshevsky family and focuses on the Sabbath um, and looks at what happens after the turn of the 20th century when much of the garment industry moved to factories which required Saturday work. How did families negotiate um, the challenge of having to support a family economically but then having to um, desecrate the Sabbath? Um, and this is a, a supplication that was written in, in Yiddish, uh, um, that was written specially for America. And in English, um, it says, I ask you, God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, that you should guard and shelter me, my husband, and my children from Sabbath and holiday desecration. Send us to our livelihood in pleasure and not in sorrow, and we shall by no means due to livelihood not be able to make the Sabbath or the holidays weekly, and we shall be able to rest on the holidays and serve you with all of our heart. Being able to read that supplication in this apartment and consider the challenge of a family who is trying to put together the Sabbath but knows that it has to send teenage children into the workforce, this supplication becomes all the more important because it shows that even as family members might have been breaking the Sabbath, often they were doing so in order to bring in the funds that allowed some celebration of the Sabbath for other members of the family. That in and of, in and of itself is an important contribution to the ways in which people think about history. The vast majority of our visitors come with the idea that people threw their Sabbath candlesticks, they threw their tefillin, they threw whatever ritual um, object you want to name into the ocean when they came to America. That's the reality. That's what, that's what we're dealing with in terms of our visitors' knowledge of Jewish history. Being able to use um, a text like this in a space like this allows us to bring a lot of these issues to life, the very complexities of this history. And that's what I think the opportunity that we have here. It's not just the immersive space, but it's being able to put the texts in their context. Thank you, Annie. Our final panelist is Jonathan Rosen. Uh, Jonathan created the Arts and Letters section of the Jewish Daily Forward. He's also the author of The Talmud and the Internet, and he's currently the editorial director of Next Book for Shock and, Publi Shock and Publishing series. Jonathan. Hello. Does this work? Yeah. Ah, great. Um, Thank you very much. I'm no longer the editorial director of Next Book. I'm no longer at Next Book, but I did edit for Next Book a series of books which I did for about 10 years. And in a sense, an aspect of my biography is kind of part of uh, one of the things I want to talk about, even though that sounds uh, self-serving. Uh, but I also just want to say how nice it is for me to be here and what an honor it is for me to be here at an event uh, connected to Ismar Shorsh, who was the chancellor of the Jewish Theological Seminary when my wife was ordained as a rabbi, and so looms both as an historian and as someone who presided over her education, making me feel even less qualified than I felt before to talk about Wissenschaft. And in fact, the question that I was sent to answer, maybe we all, maybe we all were, but I somehow it seemed, it, it spoke to me and I, um, and I took it as the challenge was, uh, the question was, the challenge of bringing Jewish knowledge to a contemporary audience, what are the limitations with which you have to grapple? So immediately I started thinking about the limitations of the culture because you'd make me seem smarter and more educated to talk about the difficulties of communicating Jewish culture to a larger world. But my own limitations are so great that I quickly realized I had to address those also and that they're part of it and I can't separate them in the same way that I'd like to think or do think that the possibilities I have felt in my own relationship to 
Jewishness and Judaism and Jewish culture and Jewish learning are connected to possibilities I see even in an assimilated or uh, world or a world of attenuated Jewish learning. Basically, I was going to get a PhD in English literature. I was going to uh, study Milton. I was an undergraduate at <coughs> Yale, where I might have had you as a teacher had you been there, but I am, I'd like to apologize for being the only person here not <laughs> to have studied with you, and that undoubtedly will be the source of all my errors. Um, <laughs> but in any case, I dropped out of graduate school because uh, I wanted to be a writer, and I got my first real job in 1990 helping to create the Forward newspaper. Uh, not as a daily, it had been this, in, uh, this great Yiddish daily, but to create it as an English language weekly newspaper. I was hired by Seth Lipsky, a very visionary editor who wanted to do this. And I created the culture section and was kind of part of that whole project. And that project was shot through with all the questions that I feel I was asked for this panel in a sense because what does it mean to take a Yiddish newspaper and put it in another language? And uh, to what extent would it still be a Jewish newspaper? And to what extent w were we assuming knowledge on the part of our readers? And to what extent was it a translation? It wasn't a translation. To what extent was it a new creation? It wasn't a new creation. It was sort of like we were inventing an accent, which makes it sound uh, less large than it felt at the time. And it was full of surprises, but it was also full of this sense of, um, of confusion about what direction Jewish culture moves in and what it even is. Uh, in any case, uh, I got my job because my parents were friends with Lucy Davidovich, who was a great historian of the Holocaust and very knowledgeable uh, in many large ways about Jewish culture. Uh, she was a family friend, and she told Seth Lipsky, who she knew, you should hire uh, Jonathan. And she told me, you should go do something, because I had dropped out of graduate school to be a writer. Um, so I was hired, and uh, I wrote a column. I was given a column right away. I didn't know anything, but I wrote a column every week. And Lucy was always telling me what I ought to write about. Uh, she died about a year after we started the forward, but it was wonderful to have her call me, often to tell me what I had done wrong, but often to tell me what I ought to do. And one of the things she kept saying to me is, you should write about Jewish studies, and you should start with Edmund Wilson. And she sent me an essay by Edmund Wilson, The Need for Jewish Studies. And I kept it in my drawer for the 10 years that I was at the Forward. And I never did uh, write about it, even though when I was an undergraduate at Yale, they were just deciding about whether to have a Jewish Studies program. And the debates were very important for me because there was a, the professors I knew and had were all wanted to argue that it was restoring to Western civilization a pillar that ought to have been there all along, and really should have been there, but had somehow crumbled. Uh, and the way it actually turned out is that it was not through that noble door, even though Orim Batumim is the Hebrew you know, uh, motto of Yale, a along with a Latin motto. Uh, but instead, it entered through a kind of window, which uh, women's studies and African American studies and many other studies entered in. It was a kind of post-60s reflection of individual need and not uh, this assertion of the overarching culture. And the tension between those two things was very interesting for me. Nevertheless, I didn't do the Edmund Wilson uh, column. But in honor of Lucy, I just I wanted to um, read a very small entry from Edmund Wilson's diary uh, from 1968. Because a, a few years ago, I was reading his journals. He kept these great journals. And they've published them decade by decade, starting in the 20s. And he was really, I think, the great one of the great critics of literature in the 20th century. And, uh, he was not Jewish, but of course he wrote his essay on the need for Jewish studies. He was a great critic of American literature. In any case, uh, this was written in 1968. It's at the end of uh, Wilson's career and towards the end of his life. And I think it'll become apparent why I'm reading it. And I'll skip. It's very short, but I'm going to skip uh, a little piece and I'll tell you when I skip. A young couple from the Job Corps came in for drinks on the 16th. I had been working all day on my proofs for the Scrolls book. He spent 20 years translating and annotating and creating a book on the Dead Sea Scrolls. He taught himself Hebrew and really mastered it quite well. So, uh, and it was published the following year in 69, not that many years before he died. Um, so I'd been working all day on my proofs for the Scrolls book and would far rather have relaxed with a drink and the phonograph. These two young people depressed me profoundly. He is Jewish and has a black beard that makes him look like a Hebrew prophet. She is 
pale blonde and has pale blue eyes with glasses and two long wisps of hair hanging down on either side of her face. She gives piano lessons. He has been teaching two and a half years at the Job Corps. They have a five-year-old son. She was very quiet, but he is a pseudo-serious-minded, blah, blah, young revoltee. He is resigning from the, from the Corps with much indignation that Wilson isn't interested in at all, and now I'm skipping. Uh, he studied government at Boston University and is now going back to get a PhD in education just for practical reasons, as the man says. It made it easier to get a job. He talked continually about his ideas about education, about which he had nothing concrete to say. All problems, methods, decisions, nothing but abstract words. I told him that education, aside from reading and writing and the multiplication tables, was intended to teach you to do something, to master some art or craft or some technique. He had no interest in this. Elena, Wilson's wife, said, you had to learn some discipline. Why? Why did you need discipline? And then I'm skipping to the very end. His five-year-old was going in for art. And he, meaning the man himself, didn't approve of what they were making the boy do. He thought that this was outrageous. They would kill his creativity. He was a disturbing example of what I had se hadn't yet seen in person, the idiotic desire of young people to blame everything wrong on somebody else and to manufacture grievances. I became more and more snubbing, although I tried to keep things good humored. And then this is the key sentence. He had no Jewish education and couldn't read the shalom on the mantelpiece. And the shalom, of course, written in Hebrew. So here is this grandson of a minister, great critic of American literature, expressing nothing but contempt for this um, empty-headed man. For, and, the, and I guess partly my question is, what good would Wissenschaft be for this person who is not interested in any kind of systematic learning at all? Uh, but another thing that interested me is his son, because his son is five years old in this passage, and the passage was written in 68. So his son was born in 1963, and that's when I was born. So his son is really my peer, and I feel I know his son and his daughter, if he has one, and grew up with them and went to school with them. And in a way, I guess I feel like all my projects have partly been for this son. Uh, and in a sense, uh, the foreword, where we always talked about how it was for the grandchildren and great-grandchildren of immigrants, who now were immigrants inside of Jewish culture, uh, was in a sense it imagined him as a reader. Uh, I wrote a book called The Talmud and the Internet, which is partly about not knowing Talmud or juxtaposing it with some modern technological secular impulses. Um, I wrote a novel, Joy Comes in the Morning, which is partly an exploration of Jewish culture where I felt only in a novel and a story could you kind of capture the paradoxes of all of this learning, especially because that kid may well have things to have taught to teach me, and who knows what happened to him? Anything is possible. He could have wound up at Aisha Torah for 20 years and <laughs> never come out. Um, but also, I wanted, I think I've been haunted by this passage for the several years since I've read it because I realize I also am that kid. And I do not have the Jewish education or did not grow up with the Jewish education that I would so much like to have grown up with. And um, in a way, the grappling with that ignorance has became its own subject. And my children went, my daughters, I have two daughters, they both went to day school. And my fantasy was that they were going to come out the other end knowing everything I lacked and all the tools I hoped that they, well, you know, all the tools I hoped they would have. But in fact, um, my daughters, who are very, very smart, are both dyslexic. And so, in a sense, they did not come out knowing all the things I wished I'd known. And indeed, through them, I learned that I myself am dyslexic, which partly explains why my struggles with Hebrew were so large and German. I had once considered wanting to be a uh, go to graduate school, not in English literature, but in Jewish studies, and I just, I couldn't manage the languages. And so it raised all these, and raises for me, all of these complicated questions. They're not a challenge to Wissenschaft in a way, or to Jewish learning, but they do complicate my own relationship to what it means to have knowledge. And uh, I, I don't want to speak too much. I'm going to try to end very soon. But one of the things I did with my daughter was um, we, I read her The Chosen because I thought it would be nice for her to see that instead of just chucking one form of Judaism, different forms of Judaism can hate each other and that that's a healthier outlet. And you can abandon one form. And I realized to what extent that novel, which has been read by millions of people, far more probably than any work of scholarship and has represented Jewish culture and aspects of it to huge numbers of people, 
um, is very much an application of Wissenschaft, and it's also a kind of critique of it. And Danny, who's this tzaddik in waiting, this child of a tzaddik, reads his way out of Hasidism. And one of the books he reads is clearly a work of Wissenschaft, and it's, it gives a very negative portrait of Hasidism. And all that sort of learning does for him is whittle down what he already has. And what's interesting for me, and one of the things I talk to my daughter about, is that the other piece of his Jewishness that's essential is his soul, and that he gets from his father, who doesn't talk to him, not that that's what we do at home, but it's the opposite of reading and learning and information, it's silence. And that those two things need to go together. And so, in a way, for me, those two things are the connected elements, and dyslexia is real, it's an actual thing, doesn't mean you can't read, uh, and you can ap apprehend all sorts of knowledge and information, but I, have come to I came to realize that all the things I was in, that I did, even writing in the Talmud and the internet, my interest was the oral nature of things, and that written, the written word, which I had been raised to believe was the great pinnacle of Jewish evolution, in fact, was partly a default, which we turned to when we lost our land and when we were in exile and when we had to write down wonderful oral flexible things and that there was an element of loss about it and uh, when i was and when i was in when i was an undergraduate at yale uh, yerushalmi yosef yerushalmi was already someone already referred to zahur um, published uh, zahur and i remember harold bloom who was one of my professors reviewed it at great length in the new york review of books and we all talked about it and it was a revelation because here was this great historian actually saying it was possible to know every piece of information about Judaism, and yet that may not actually be Jewish knowledge at all, whereas apprehending or remembering or recreating in your mind what the Sabbath is, which is not the same as knowing about it historically or contextualizing it, that actually may be a higher form of Jewish knowledge or a more traditional form of Jewish knowledge. And so even then, that conversation sank into me long before I knew I had a name for any of my own difficulties in learning certain things, but I very much appreciated that back and forth, just as I now often think that, you know, the land, when we live in this extraordinary time, the land of Israel is itself one of the many Jewish New Testaments we've all had to think about, like the Talmud, and that it's just earth, it's not even words. And all the weirdness and excitement that follows from coming to terms with those things that are not only verbal. And so, I guess I would only really end by saying that, of course, I have no answer for any of this, but um, I guess one of the things that has always seemed important to me, increasingly so now, is to tell the story about the people who do the thinking and the scholarship and the history. Because there are some scholars for whom scientific learning is just a, was the higher form of assimilation. There were others for whom it meant something else. When I edited this, when I created this series, the Jewish Encounters series, uh, initially it was going to be a series of introductions to great classic Jewish works. And I quickly realized nobody is going to read them. Doesn't matter how snappily introduced they are. Some of them, the Kuzari, let's say, although it's a wonderful thing to read. Uh, better to do biographies, perhaps, and to have people who are not scholars have an encounter with those books. And that the reader, this phantom eight year, five year old boy, now grown up, could watch someone, perhaps a scholar of another field, stretch herself or himself towards that subject. And for me, biography, which is not a traditional Jewish pursuit, is, has been very interesting and invigorating for just that reason. In the same way, you don't just want to teach someone Darwinian evolution. You want to remind them Darwin was born and growing up, grew up thinking God made the world and every plant in it and put them all in their place. And then he came up with a different notion, but he was still trailing aspects of a very different world, which helps account for all those religious impulses potentially detectable in his writing. He grew up in one world, created another, and we live in a third that has been handed down to us. And so I guess all I'd say is the stories surrounding the learning for me are very important as well. Thanks. A defensive <laughs> question. Um, maybe we'll follow the practice of the first panel and take three questions and then ask the panelists to respond. Please.
Thank you. Uh, please? Yes. Here, here. Yes, Mark. I'm sure there. Well, what, go ahead. Third question. Third, third question. I was going to let Annie answer that anyway. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, Billy. Good. Okay. Great. Okay. So, um, who, who would like to respond first? Um, well, I'll. I'll, I'll I, I don't. No, that I have a good answer. I would. I do think there are scholars. Definitely, there are scholars in this series, um, and Deborah Lipstadt is a historian uh, of mo you know a modern Jewish historian, and she wrote a book about the Eichmann trial, and that was work. Even uh, it was an amazing discovery. Although I've known academics all my life because my father was one, uh, an amazing discovery to realize how much work it was to. Uh, persuade someone to move even three steps to the left of what they consider to be their actual field and uh, to try to take a speculative leap in some in some way um, but there, there were scholars who of different fields even Robert Pinsky's professor of English literature wrote about King David uh, but there I, it was probably I mean I would have been very I, I'm, that series is now over but the idea was also to choose writers who were writers who would then have an encounter with a Jewish subject more than to choose scholars who would have an encounter with another uh, scholarly <laughs> subject. But it, I'm sure it was also my limitation. I would say that one of the things that initially daunted me was the discovery that the people who knew and cared about art and culture, who I initially went to, knew so little often about Jewish life or culture that they were not qualified. And the people who were s steeped in scholarship were often not interested, or in the, a certain kind of learning, were le either less interested or less inclined, or perhaps less narratively gifted to do the opposite. And it was a sorrow that there was this gap, which was partly what I had hoped to, to fill. So, but I should have consulted you. <laughs> oh, why didn't someone write about a scholar? Well, we do have we did we did a book I loved, which was called um, Sacred Trash, has Solomon Schechter at its core. And Goethe. Yes, and Goethe, and, a whole, and that whole world of scholars who are written about almost as the inheritors of the rabbinic tradition, where they're piecing together a puzzle that can never be put together, but that almost has religious as well as scholarly meaning. And and Solomon Schechter was you know the man for so many. That's an excellent question. Um, so let me try and answer it in a couple of different ways um, about uh, what would have happened had Wissenschaft never uh, arisen. Um, I did toy once upon a time with the counterfactual of what if Moses Mendelssohn had been turned away at the gates of Berlin and the Haskalah would have had to unfold in somehow different fashion. But then again, you get into this issue of counterfactuals and intellectual history being very uh, difficult to pull off for the reason being if you subtract, for instance, John Locke or Voltaire from the Enlightenment, you still have the Enlightenment. If you take Michelangelo or da Vinci out of the Renaissance, you still have the Renaissance because collective movements that are of an intellectual or cultural fashion or of cultural form, they oftentimes proceed anyway. But what I might um, perhaps do in a very Jewish way is turn your question into another question by asking the question, if Wissenschaft des Judentums um, had not arisen, would the emancipation of German Jews have been affected in any way? Obviously their mission was to advance and hasten emancipation, but we all know that until 1869-71 it really didn't happen. And I'm certainly not the person in the room who would be able to assess the success or failure of the Wissenschaft project, um, but if it hadn't existed, I imagine that either German Jewish or Central European Jewish emancipation might have been delayed or maybe it wouldn't have been affected whatsoever, which does then get into the question I, rose, uh, I brought up earlier in terms of causality 
counterfactuals can maybe play a role. What was the ultimate reason for the delayed emancipation of Central European, Central European Jews in, in Germany and Austria? Probably didn't have a lot to do with Wissenschaft, and yet they, the, the practitioners of the movement certainly believed that they could contribute something. So I'll throw it out to the, the audience to see if, there's any, if there are any answers to that question, but it's, it's an excellent provocative question. about oral tradition, um, one of the things that I, I spoke about, the immersive space, and I spoke about the texts at the Tenement Museum, but key to all of it is the storytelling of the educators, and those are educators who are trained by professional um, historians um, um, throughout the year. Um, and the storytelling is extremely important because, again, as opposed to a wall text that, you know, maybe scholars craft and then throw out there and put it on the wall and walk away for a decade. Um, the ability to change the story allows people to respond to the people in the room. So if we're talking about transmission and we're really talking about audience, that live storytelling is very, very important in um, meeting people where they are. What is the knowledge that they have? I t spoke a little bit about the Tenement Museum um, and the variety of immigrant stories that we tell. I should say also that the 210,000 visitors, while you know, a portion of them are Jewish, um, the majority probably are not Jewish visitors um, as well. The educators teaching, for the most part, are not Jewish as well. So this really, the storytelling has to do a lot with um, training, but then also responding to the people in the audience. So the oral tradition is incredibly important there as well. Well, because it's the people who lend it. No, 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 no. I mean, well, I mean, in terms of the stories that are told, that if you look at the census in 1900, every single resident of the of the tenement at the time was Jewish. The sources that we're using are helping to tell a Jewish story. There's no question about it. Uh, what I was saying is institutionally, the founders of the museum, because it was so important for them to kind of be able to tell an immigrant story more broadly, they chose not to define it specifically as such. Um, but it is, it's a really interesting, I think, blending of the academic discipline of history with a variety of people, both who work there and who visit, who are from a variety of, of backgrounds. Um, but. Well, I, I think we're going to end here. Thanks. I'd like to thank the panelists. Um, and once again, congratulate Ismar Shorsh for his accomplishments and his receipt, uh, re receiving the medal.